right, episode 17. I, I wasn't so confident we'd get this far, but now I think we're pacing for 100. So it's been a blast. You going to make it to 100? Do you have the, the stamina no. for it? Or no. do you like hanging out with me like that? No. I think I think Jeff was done at 10. <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, but you know 17 what? 17 times I had to sit next to you. Oh, my gosh. And here's to uh, many, many more. But I'm excited today about I, I episode. I when this started. <laughs> we know that's a lie. Jeff hasn't had hair since uh, he failed out of school. So... Sure. Yeah, eighth grade was a, eighth grade was a tough year for him. <laughs> you know, hey, we're we're super excited geometry. to have Brian here today, who's sitting here now. He's gonna start losing his hair. Listen to us banter. Uh, we don't want that he's to got happen. Nice hair. Got it going he's on. Got, he's got good hair. No, good hair and a nice business model, and we're excited to learn about it today. <laughs> Brian is the chief operating officer of Carbon Quest. They have been leading the charge decarbonizing residential, commercial buildings, uh, specifically in New York City. I've had the pleasure of getting to tour their pilot site and, and uh, getting to work with Brian some. And I'm really excited, Brian, to hear more about what y'all are doing. Of course, you have a longstanding history of working in decarbonization, renewable energy, specifically for building structures. And so we're appreciative to have you on today and, and look forward to you enlightening the audience. Yeah, uh, Luke and Jeff, great to see you. Thanks for the invite. Lucky number 17. Uh, I figured maybe I should have been number 100. Uh, uh, but <laughs> yeah, we'll have you come back. There we go. Hey, if we survive that long. Yeah, <laughs> you, you don't think we're going to run out of things to talk about? Although, man, I'm, I could keep going. But about, yeah. No, we knew it was your favorite number, and so we, we lined it up. So, yeah, I just, I'll, I'll piggyback on his introduction and say, you know, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, capture, obviously. The name of the podcast is Catching, Catching Carbon. We talk, talk a lot about it. People, you know, new initiatives, new innovations. Are we going down that pathway? Are we going to sequester and all that? You guys are actually already doing it. So uh, when, when Luke says you're at the forefront of it all, I mean, that's, that's I think, the most important. That's why we're excited to talk to you and understand more. You know, what are you doing? Where are you doing it? Why is it effective and in, in working uh, ahead of the curve of where a lot of places are doing? And, and really kind of what do you see downstream? Where's, where's the future going? So. Yeah, for sure. And to tee it up, Brian, let's just, you know, natural gas combustion, that's where you guys can play. Why don't you run us through some of what you're doing in New York City? You know, what drove it? What's that technology kind of look like? And, and we can, you know, totally fan out from there. Perfect. Well, I'm going to weave two main themes here. One, capturing carbon, name of the podcast, straight down the middle for what we're doing at Carbon Quest. And I'll bring in the number 17 back at, around again at some point, being the nice. 17th podcast. So, um, Carbon Quest. Uh, we formed the, the company a few years ago with the mission of decarbonizing buildings. Buildings being large B buildings from multifamily to commercial office, hospitals, schools, multi-use. Uh, with a particular focus on, as you mentioned, uh, Luke, natural gas combustion. Um, Picture boilers for heating and hot water in a building, cogeneration to power a building or buildings with, and steam, uh, fuel cells that are also doing uh, something similar. And um, across the United States, in both commercial and industrial, over a gigaton and a half of emissions comes from natural gas combustion on site in those categories that we mentioned. So that's sort of the bogey that we're trying to focus on and reduce as quickly as we possibly can. Um, in cities in particular, we're seeing that um, large cities across the world, there's over a thousand of them that have carbon reduction targets. Within cities, buildings typically comprise 60 to 80 percent of carbon emissions. In New York City, it's 67 percent. So cities and buildings are having to start to marry together to come together to reduce emissions. Um, what are they doing? They're creating programs, compliance style programs, to effectively encourage, potentially force buildings to comply with standards. New York has initiated one such program called Local Law 97. Um, Local Law 97 will cap emissions for 50,000 of the largest buildings starting in less than nine, by a little bit over nine months from now. The largest category, and here's where the number 17 comes, the largest category in New York City for emissions, guess what it is? Natural gas combustion on site today. 17 million tons of carbon dioxide is emitted through natural gas combustion on site. Is that, that daily or annually? That's annually, thank you, annually. Um, the remainder being electricity, transportation, waste, fugitive emissions. So really how do we get that 
that amount down as, as quickly and as cost effectively as we can for building owners. Well, we took um, a lot of the core tenets of carbon capture at large industrial gas and uh, power generation facilities and took it down to a building level. Uh, we designed it in such a way that it's safe to operate, um, doesn't require a significant amount of uh, people in the loop from a maintenance standpoint, is cost effective, and um, is s relatively small in a footprint s setting. But if you picture like a boiler system or something like that, um, and it's an additive to the boiler system. And so that is exactly what we're doing, effectively carbon capture. So we're capturing flue gas exhaust, the carbon dioxide that would otherwise got out of chimney, we're taking it from going out the chimney, anywhere between zero to 100% of that exhaust, running it through a system that we've designed, the end product being liquid carbon dioxide, and then we're utilizing that in applications that create additional benefit, beneficial use like concrete manufacturing, e-fuels, and other areas of utilization of CO2. That's great. So I want to go back and kind of unpack that a little bit more on the on the building side of it. So when you say 70% of a city's emissions come from buildings, is that inclusive of the transportation that's on the road as well? It, so that's the remainder. So 70% comes from electricity. It comes from natural gas. Some buildings still use fuel oil and in even some cases propane. Um, so that's the 70%. Uh, it is about 60% of that number, of that 70% number is natural gas usage. Um, outside of that 70% number is transportation. Urban environments, which makes sense, they typically use uh, quite a, a, a bit of um, mass transit that uh, lowers the overall transmit, transportation emissions. Um, but it's still, it's, the buildings are pretty meaningful. Across the United States... Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of where I was going with that. Like, you know, we spend all of our time on the transportation sector, whether it's electric vehicles, now we've got hydrogen fuel cells for vehicles, you know, heavy duty trucks. But, you know, that, and that's certainly important. I mean, it's still a big number, but I think we focus on that one so much because it's tangible, right? I mean, it's something that we all could have to. Everybody understands it. You drive a car, you fuel the gas. If we don't do that, we're not emitting. But the buildings are two or three times more volume and CO2 emissions than the, than the vehicles themselves, at least in an urban area, like you say. So, yeah, so it's really interesting. And I'm, now the wheels are turning for me, I've got to ask the question, right? So it is, I think you had said uh, New York was putting into place this, this law for, for 50,000 of the largest buildings, was it 50,000? So now you think, well, the milkman has to come and drop off milk every day. The guy that's going to come pick up this captured CO2, I mean, is he stopping at 50,000 buildings? Can you kind of walk through what that looks like? Because I've always thought from a residential standpoint, two challenges, scaling down technology and keeping it cost effective. And then what do you do with the CO2 when it's at your apartment complex or a four unit multifamily? Yeah, so... Um... We, it could be used at all 50,000 or anywhere there's natural gas combustion. Um, not all buildings will utilize it. This, as we view, is one, one tool, carbon capture for, for the built environment or distributed carbon capture is one tool in the decarbonization toolkit. And in many cases can be used in conjunction with energy efficiency, distributed generation like solar, um, potentially electrification as well, uh, in many cases electrifying hot water load and things like that, and then carbon capture as well. The, the idea behind distributing this and putting it at the source, like you had mentioned with um, 30,000 buildings or so, does require a uh, concerted effort. What, is, what does it require? It requires a lot of on-site storage tanks uh, for, for uh, carbon dioxide, liquid carbon dioxide. It requires a distribution network in many cities and throughout the United States and country, other countries, there is an existing distribution network. This will need to be increased as well. Um, as, and then also um, potentially any uh, further distribution uh, for, for CO2. The, this is sort of akin in a way to how fuel oil was done in many cities previously, right? We thought, well, how, how did the heat come on? Well, there was fuel that was delivered into each individual building. Um, 50,000 of them at some point. And um, it's just kind of reversing that process. And instead of doing it with fuel oil, it's doing it with CO2. 
then the, the question you asked, Luke, about uses of CO2. Um, the market itself, traditionally, it, it, you know better than we do, uh, has been using CO2 in food and beverage, medical device, um, fire suppression, and, and a bunch of other um, industries. Other industries are now starting to emerge um, from really focusing on reducing emissions. One of the big ones is concrete manufacturing, utilizing different types of technology to embed CO2, liquid CO2, or a form of liquid CO2, into the mixing process to reduce the emissions coming from concrete manufacturing. There's a lot of effort going on in the um, e-fuel space, whether it's renewable natural gas blending um, CO2 with uh, the existing stock or sustainable aviation fuel displacing petroleum and utilizing carbon dioxide as well, and um, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of usage now of this CO2 that's emerging, and emerging pretty quickly. Eventually, we see where the market's headed in terms of um, geological storage of carbon dioxide because of the acute problem we have with emissions in the environment and the federal government in particular spending a lot of capital on not only carbon capture, but use and storage of CO2. And so we're, our business follows that same path. Yeah, so I've, got, I've actually got several questions and all that, uh, you know, because of the infrastructure and everything needed in the downstreams. But uh, let, let's take a second and kind of dive into Local Law 97 a little bit more, because I think that's important. And, you know, I, I'm a huge an advocate's not the right word, but uh, you know, I always say in Europe, there's a lot of penalties. There's carbon taxes, carbon trade, things like that. You're, you're penalized in Europe for your carbon emissions and why they're kind of farther along on some of these uh, initiatives. In the U.S. now with 45Q, we're incentivizing the capture of it, but really not penalizing. Local law, local law 97 is actually a penalty, right? So the emissions off of an individual building owner if they don't reduce it by X and fill in the blanks of what that means by, I think it's 2024, they start paying a, a straight up tax, right? And then, so that's really the, the impetus of what's driving your technology in the buildings uh, today because they, they, it's, it's more costly to not capture it than it is to just continue to admit it. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, great point, Jeff. So um, it would be great if, Everyone just decided to adopt certain technologies because it felt like a good thing right, to do. I think we could all agree, or at least I believe, that that won't happen, right? So um, we could argue then, and, and I have lots of thoughts around carbon taxes and, and ex, ex, pricing and externalities that drive behavior. Um, that's kind of what Local Law 97 is, and it is driving behavior for sure. Um, the way the law works itself is it's a carbon-based program. Starting next year in 2024, all, all buildings above 25,000 square feet, which there are 50,000 of them under this law, will be given a threshold of carbon that it can emit. <clears throat> and that is based on the type of building it is and the square footage. If a building were to emit more than that amount, they will be charged at $268 per metric ton some of the highest pricing on the market today. Not all buildings, the way it's been designed, not all buildings will be subject to pay, will, will pay a tax uh, because they will be under the threshold based on how their current emissions profile is. It's estimated by the Real Estate Board in New York that 5,000 buildings will have to start paying a penalty starting in 2024 at an aggregate of about a billion dollars per year. Until 2030, when it's estimated almost 20,000 or more buildings will have to start paying a penalty because so of limits. Scale, so, yeah, yeah. Okay. We know where the story goes from there. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't turn back around at all. It gets, it's, it gets more punitive, which, which makes sense. And um, it's, it causes, a, a, causes a, a stir because you do have some universities that are paying multi-million dollar penalties or commercial office buildings that are paying multi, multi-million dollar penalties. Um, the building that we're doing our first project in is facing uh, between one hundred and fifty and a two hundred thousand dollar penalty starting in twenty twenty four. Wow, that's the annual tax penalty. Annual, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's like at the end of the day, behavior. you can do 
several things, or and I'm sure it's uh, and all of the above within the building. I mean, you could put high efficiency lighting in, you could put solar in, you could, but you could do all of those things and probably not get yourself under that threshold. If you're burning natural gas and emitting, what percentage roughly on an average building? And obviously, you know that's a, a moving target. But what what do you what do you what are you kind of capturing or reducing their their overall emissions by percentage wise on a general building? Yeah. So, and you're absolutely right. It very much depends upon a number of factors, including the type of building and the type of infrastructure that they have in place. So for a typical multifamily property, typically the emissions profile will be 50% from electricity and 50% from natural gas. Electricity emissions will be driven primarily through pumps, HVAC for air conditioning, elevators, lighting, um, and, and the like. And then the boilers themselves with natural gas, heating and hot water. Every building varies, but about 50-50. We can reduce up to 50% of this natural gas load um, in, 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 in capturing all of those emissions. It depends upon what a customer is really looking to do. Um, you know, do you, are you looking to do it from uh, a future emissions reduction standpoint? You're looking to do it more to meet compliance program so you'll do a little bit less. We're finding that um, it depends upon buildings and building owners and what they're looking for. On average, what we're seeing in places like New York, um, on average, to, to purchase or buy a system like what we're doing today, it's about a four to seven year payback on the capital. Um, and uh, it's relatively early days, but um, it's a pretty good sign, not only on the pricing side, but the fact that we can put together uh, an approach that can make economic sense today with future possibilities of getting that down even further with volume. Yeah, and you know, thinking through that, I, you, it really is building by building. What space is available? So you have to put this, you know, whether it be in the basement or on the roof or, I mean, I just think if a multifamily consists of livable units and you don't have that space and we're in New York yeah. City and there's no backyard. I mean, I, I would imagine the Carbon Quest team is is just constantly refining the offering, shrinking that footprint. You have to be able to probably, rather than have one large skid, kind of daisy chain equipment together around what's available. I mean, that makes this very complex. Uh, the technology is proven, but now how do you get it to fit for all of these, you know, retrofitting for all of these existing yeah. buildings and the infrastructure that is, you know, the concrete jungle. Yeah, and that was going to be one of my questions and all that earlier was, is there, you kind of mentioned, you know, the old propane and that kind of thing, the milk run, but is there a way to pipeline together multiple units in a, in a city block or something like that? So you you have one liquefaction center capturing multiple multiple boiler captures. Uh, is that even feasible at this moment or something you guys are looking at? Yeah. We have to get you in our R&D uh, team. Right oh, always coming up with good ideas. Uh, it's absolutely, absolutely with, um, um, as, as we scale further, we see lots of opportunity to do more community style um, approach here or trying to take advantage of, like you said, uh, city blocks or something like that. If you, if you think about it in parallel, um, the renewable energy industry has kind of gone that way with solar, right? Where they're trying to do community solar because it may be challenged for building to building to uh, adopt uh, solar uh, on site. The the interesting thing there on that parallel is, and I don't know what this number is, but it, it's it's very challenging to do solar in an urban environment. It depends upon the city, of course, but the the footprint of large buildings typically doesn't work very well with um, something like solar. And so, but if you think about carbon capture, really kind of thinking about a boiler system, thinking about, um, uh, you know, like an enclosed um, um, mechanical system that we're focusing on getting it down. But to your point, Luke, we're looking at certain innovations where we don't need all contiguous space for our system. We can put it on skids throughout a building to maximize space within a building, whether it be a boiler room, a cogeneration room, or a mechanical room, um, a parking garage, uh, a setback, an elevated setback at a building or a roof or an outdoor location. We're spending a lot of time on how do we, how do we cite these because it is a challenge for sure. 
And there are certain buildings that just don't necessarily work well with this type of technology given the footprint. And it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. There's other opportunities that that building probably has to reduce, or you can reduce it more at one building to then benefit your neighbor or something like that. Yeah, so so you, you what I heard you say is you got a four to seven year payback and in year one of this law, 2024, you've got uh, identified 5,000 targeted people that are going to be taxed on this. So sales cycle, pretty simple at this point. You're just, you're just uh, flushing them out or <laughs> what's, what's the obstacles? I mean, obviously it's a, it's a great idea and it's a great concept, but you know, I'm, I'm sure you're facing a lot of headwinds just from the, the ultimate consumer. But what, uh, what are your biggest obstacles you're seeing so far? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, the main one is awareness. Why, why, would I, why would I do this? Um, it sounds great, but uh, um, we've been using a bad, or I've been using a bad analogy, not we, so I'll point the finger at myself. Um, if, if you're familiar with the whole six degrees to Kevin Bacon, right? Uh, so um, now with, enter, with electric vehicles, you're probably at six degrees to somebody who owns an electric vehicle, if not one or two. 10 years ago, probably a lot more degrees, and that's what was struggling. Why wouldn't you buy an electric vehicle? It makes sense, or maybe there's range anxiety, but that sort of thing. With carbon capture, there are, there are lots of degrees away from somebody who owns carbon capture today. It's just an awareness, if you're familiar with like crossing the chasm, uh, getting the early adopters to adopt that really appreciate early technology. Does it work? Yes. Is it economical? Yes. Um, does it fit in a building space? Yes. Is it safe? Yes. It just takes time to build that awareness and we're trying to find the early adopters and we are. They're, they're, we recently had done a New York Times article to explain more about what we're doing and what carbon capture is and why and um, we've received a lot of interest from, from those that are saying, I'm trying to reduce our emission. we're trying to reduce our emissions as quickly as possible without a major disruption to our facility and um, we want to do it today. And um, that is helping to shorten the cycle of adoption. Um, but it just takes time, like anything else. Is uh, part of the awareness just on the, the, the local law 97 itself? Or is it until people start getting that tax bill, they don't really believe it? Is that, you know, till I feel the actual pain? It's, it's a little bit of that too. Um, and, um, one of the challenges is what to do, right? Buildings haven't really had a program or pressure like this to comply from a, an emissions standpoint. Right. Corporations are seeing it a, a bit with the science-based target initiatives to um, map out emissions and emissions reduction and, and how they're going to achieve it. Um, other cities have done some similar programs. Tokyo has a similar program. Washington, D.C. has a, a renewable energy standard, but uh, we're at sort of, in the baseball analogy, the second inning of all this, even though it feels right. like, from a climate standpoint, we're in extra innings, like the game's going to be over soon, right? Um, but it, it'll, the adoption, at least in the building environment, it, my opinion, it feels like it's early on. And so it, uh, it, it does, does cause building owners to say, what should we do? What, what, what is the right plan for us? And so they're going through that whole decision process as we speak. Local Law 97 for sure adds that catalyst to force a decision in a way. Um, and that's maybe where some pricing and some externalities like carbon taxes and, and others can really further drive um, activity. Um, get a little bit above the 30,000 foot level at this point. But yeah, I, I just... Like what, what's going to drive us to start reducing emissions as quickly as possible? It just feels like it's not moving fast enough. Um, and the, the analogy we've been using is like the time value of carbon. So just like the time value of money in finance, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. I like that. Time value of carbon. A ton of carbon reduced today is worth more than a ton of carbon reduced tomorrow or 10 years from now or 20 years from now seems like we should be doing as much as we can. And so anyway, the point being, um, yeah, it's a bit of awareness. Local on 97 is certainly driving that. Other cities adopting, corporations adopting. Um, and we 
we think it's going to happen and just how do you make that happen quickly? One of my last questions is so other cities adopting yeah, that's, who's that's on, who, say, yeah. who's on your radar right now? Who, who's the, what's the next domino to fall when it comes to an equivalent of local, local law 97? Yeah, there's other cities that are um, contemplating different programs to meet their own citywide initiatives. Um, and then they're adopting them to some degree to their own building stock and their own community, which not all cities are made equal. Um, Boston is one which has a program. It's called uh, Birdo 2.0. Um, and um, there's um, other... Canada has a, a tax that's a, a, a federal tax on um, natural gas consumption that I believe is at about $30 Canadian per ton today and expected to potentially rise up to $100 per Canadian ton at some point in the not too distant future. And um, so um, cities like that in, in California, there's the low carbon fuel standard in addition to other cities that have been adopting um, the, uh, like Berkeley and others, some, some programs associated with carbon, reducing carbon in, in building San Francisco. Um, like we said, we just start to see it's a matter of time before other global cities will start to adopt similar programs. And at the same time, corporations, we're getting a lot of interest from corporations who um, have significant sustainability goals and haven't necessarily thought through, look, we, we use a lot of natural gas for our process and, and we don't want to go away from it anytime soon. Or we installed boilers five years ago. We're expecting to last 20 to 30 years. What do we do with that infrastructure? This allows, let's call it a bridge. You know, we don't want to consider it a bridge, but it, maybe it is a bridge to something else. We're not getting off fossil fuels anytime soon. We can talk about it all day long, but it's, it's not going away. So. Yeah. So why not try to tackle with what we have now? Absolutely. Not be afraid that we feel like there's a, this is going to only continue to foster fossil fuel production, but look at alternatives at the same time. But at the end of the day, also, you've got, like you said, renewable natural gas and things like that. So we're capturing the methane and then... So it's, it's already there anyway, so why not use that that's already existing from, from natural recurring landfills, dairy waste, and other things like that. Well, hey, Brian, uh, super interesting. You guys are on the, 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 the cusp of something really, really uh, fascinating. And like I said from the beginning, you guys are actually doing it where a lot of people are just talking about it. We got some technologies, but you actually have a commercialized market. Uh, close us out. How do, you, how do we get in touch with you? Or how does anybody get in touch with you? What, what do they need to know? Um, and uh, anything we uh, you want to close this out with? Yeah, thank you, and thanks again. I really enjoyed the time on the the podcast here. Um, the we as as you mentioned, uh, we we installed our first system a little over a year ago at a multifamily property um, in Manhattan, and um, it's been going well. We're out and we're building um, a number of projects in New York City today. And um, we're about to be doing a number of additional projects um, in, in the not too distant future, in addition to outside of New York. And um, so if, and, and what we're finding here that may be, I don't know, it's not necessarily a rallying cry, but for those building owners that are finding it hard to abate. So if you're a hospital and you're using natural gas cogeneration for power, but also for resiliency, it's a great solution. You're just looking to reduce emissions as quickly as possible because you re recently installed boilers or a fuel cell. Great, it's a, this is a great use case. Um, you recently are a commercial office building and you're facing significant penalties or have significant sustainability initiatives. This is a great, uh, great way to do it. It works outside of New York as well. Um, slightly higher paybacks, but it does work. And um, we can certainly evaluate, we're doing a, lots of evaluations for property owners um, that really all we need is um, some idea of the natural gas consumption, um, the type of combustion that you have, and then we can talk about what we, what we could possibly do for a building owner. And um, yeah, the, the typical comment of, 
it takes a village. We're always looking for partners, um, whether it be partners in um, like yourselves, Luke and, and Jeff, um, partners in um, construction, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, uh, engineering firms that are engineering these systems, uh, equipment manufacturers, and of course, real estate owners that might be interested in adopting. Um, I don't, we could, could be reached on, on email or phone or ho- however website. Uh, our website is carbonquest.com. And um, if you have any, in- if folks out there have any interest in learning more about what we're doing, please let us know. We're just trying to create more awareness and uh, appreciate having the opportunity to do so on this podcast. Yeah, well, with our reach, your inbox is about to blow up. At least guarantee. <laughs> At least it. three emails. At least. <laughs> That's awesome. Two of them for from us. But. <laughs> Here's the link. No, <laughs> Brian, you're a legend. We yes. love what you're doing over there. It's yes. it's been a pleasure to follow along with your journey. You know, be a part of it, and and we're appreciative of our relationship. Thanks for carving out some time for us. What you're doing is awesome. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Jeff.